everybody. So today we are going to be talking about the top ways that you can visualize graphs in your own institution. So visualization is so incredibly important to knowledge graph because it's a very complex problem. As with many complex problems, having a simplified visual, almost like an architectural diagram, is incredibly helpful to give a clear picture to stakeholders and others that are maybe not as familiar with what you are working on to understand what you're doing and get buy-in and, and, and make decisions on what is possible and give them an idea of why graph is so special. I also use a lot of visuals for validating some of the relationships and some of the shortest path logic that, that I use. And these visuals, they can have many different forms. So this video is going to walk through what those look like and give you some examples along the way. All right, so what we are going to do is we are going to go over the main reference types or the main types of data visualizations that you can do. We're then going to walk through the three different levels of data and what interpretations that you can enact on those levels for each of the visualization types. And then we're going to be talking about how can you mix and match these things to make your visual more effective. I'm going to put them up here on the screen so you can see as we go through. The first is the micro level, which is usually between one and about 100 records, data points, or entities, or nodes specifically if you're talking about a graph or classes. You get the gist. This is the, the lowest level that you can be at. There's a middle tier also where you can be at like a local level. This is the middle ground between the micro and the macro. And this can usually go up to about 10,000. It's usually the rule of thumb here uh, to understand what a local entity would be. So this could be uh, potentially a county or a state. So you're seeing some geographic uh, terminology here. It could be specific companies or universities or um, even departments. These are local compared to the overall scope of what you're looking at. And also the scope that we're talking about here is, is situational. So if your knowledge graph is focused on uh, just your company or just your products, then these levels are going to be perhaps your individual would be the individual asset that you ship to a customer. Your local could be uh, the, the local uh, collection or category of a certain asset. And maybe the global is the large you know, departmental category that that product would roll up into. So you're looking at this from a, a scale that is unique to your use case and not comparing it to global, meaning the entire globe or the entire universe. So just keep that in mind as we go. So speaking of global, that is the next level. Anything that goes above 10,000 records, 10,000 assets, or 10,000 classes or, or data points. And this is very often the case when you're talking about graph because we usually have a lot of data, but it depends on how you are structuring your model because you could have individual companies or you could have a class just called company. So it really depends on your use case and how you're modeling things. All right, so getting into the very first type and that is statistical. All right, so statistical is really looking at how either an individual, a specific county or state or company or you know supply chains or what have you at that global level, how is the cause and effect being mapped out? So statistical behavior is I saw this and I clicked that, or I was exposed to this and then I did this, or I didn't get this thing, so I got frustrated and I did something else. So that kind of behavior, or you know, I signed up for these accounts and then I moved money to those accounts, all of that goes into the statistical behavioral aspects of a visual foreknowledge graph. The next type is temporal. So this is talking about time. So over a course of time, and you can see how these all can be mixed and matched where you might have a behavioral output, but you might wanna look at it over a period of time to say, well, wait a minute, their behavior didn't start out fishy, but now it is a little fishy from an insurance perspective. You see what I mean? So when you're getting into temporal, you're looking at over a period of time 
And these are really helpful in many visualizations as sliders or other ways of dictating, is this behavior a point in time, a snapshot? And if I look at my data and I can identify where something uh, changed in a period of time, what was happening at that time in my product or my system or my pipeline that may have been a cause of that. So that's going back into that behavioral and mixing in some of the temporal as well. Geospatial is the next type. And a lot of the time, the visuals for geospatial are obviously going to be, uh, you know, maps, <laughs> counties, uh, the globe and seeing how things uh, show up. But I'm going to put some examples here on the screen that I actually found really interesting. They are talking about global aspects, and this one specifically is tying in uh, temporal, uh, and you can assume some behavioral because this is talking about like temperature fluctuations for the entire globe. And this is just to, to indicate that even if you are looking at something from a location perspective, you don't necessarily have to put even a label on, on that geographic. You can look at things uh, from the perspective of just longitude and latitude or which planet or which quadrant of space. There are areas that do not have a label defined to them all the time. So also keep that in mind and also make sure you know if you're doing geospatial, you don't necessarily have to have a map uh, that that corresponds to it. That's not always necessary. The next is near and dear to my heart because I do this the most in my day job and that is topical. And topical has tentacles throughout all of the different uh, variations on visualization because you're looking at a specific behavior. What's the label of that behavior? If it's a cause and effect, I purchased or I abandoned my cart. Those are, those are topical things, they, they have labels. And even if you have, you know, two things, you are now doing some of that topical modeling. If you only have one thing, then you're not doing topical modeling. Um, so, so an example of this would be all of your graph is just banks. They're just banks and uh, each one of them is just showing when, um, how many banks uh, work with each other. That's it. That's all you're looking at. So in that situation, you're not looking at topical, but even with that, you can you can add in some other layers, like all of your attributes. Well, if you're going to be doing queries on that, those might be topical as well. You might be looking at fraud detection. Well, how do you define what fraud detection is? All of that goes into what, what topical looks like for your visuals. And the next is network analysis. So this is by far the most common way that people use graphs. But think of it this way, you're not necessarily even just showing how two things are related to one another. It's really talking about the influence of, of things. So this could be a social network. It could be um, power outages, right? So we're kind of going into that behavioral a little bit where you can look at temporal, right? And say, okay, from this date to this date, why were we seeing more power outages than on a different date? And you can add that in with geospatial. There are so many ways to, to intermix these with, with the network analysis. And network analysis is really something that you can have a lot of filters on because the, the network by its definition is, is usually very, very large. So how can you put filters onto your network analysis to make them more effective? And most graph databases allow you to do some form of network analysis. And for those that don't, you better believe you better go and find one that's off the shelf or something that's free and open, because I will say it, I will say it again, you always need a visual way to show your graph work because your end users or your stakeholders do not understand graph. So being able to show them in a simplistic visual is incredibly important. And I say simplistic because these networks, they can look like hairballs. We want to avoid hairballs. The only time hairballs are really important is if you just want to draw the eye and say, oh, there's a lot of things going on because I see a lot of mess over, over here, or I don't see a lot of things going on over here. Why is it so quiet? So it's really just to draw the eye into an area that you might want to focus on for your analytics. But outside of that, 
Um, you know, hairball is different than clustering, by the way. Clustering is really looking at, yeah, hairball also is looking at um, like-minded things, the characteristics of things to cluster them together. But to me, cluster analysis is still being able to find the individual nodes in the cluster. So when you're going through these visuals, make sure that you're interpreting what of these five types need to be filters, what out of these five types is going to be useful, and what out of these five types is going to help me and my users understand this data better. All right, so now let's get into the filters. I mentioned this a little bit as we were going through the different visualization types, but they go even farther than just being able to put a, a slide for time or being able to add a drop down for geographic region. It goes a little bit farther than that, where you can actually overlay the data in a way where you are using colors or sizes. And if you are using colors, please make sure that you think about accessibility. So if you do everything in red and green, if somebody's colorblind, they're not going to understand anything that's in your visual. Also, when you were doing anything with color, remember that colors do not always mean the same thing in different cultures. The other thing you, you can play with is even if you're not doing literal sizes, you can also think about doing things that show the progression of size. Uh, and that's another technique that you can use with overlays because you can combine the colors with how they are merging together and making new colors. There are ways to show some of that behavioral thing with colors and size. And outside of color, there's also shape. So shape can be the actual shape. Is it a circle? Is it a triangle? What is it? There is how big is, is that shape? And also what, what the orientation is. So there is no orientation for a circle because it's all the same, all around, it's a circle. But if you're looking at, um, especially if you're doing arrows, the orientation of those, especially when you're looking at graph is incredibly important because it is showing you the direction of a relationship. Now, a lot of graphs also allow you to put like icons um, for, for your nodes. Again, be very aware um, socially what some of those mean because some of them can be offensive. Some of them are not as uh, well understood, but you know, just keep in mind that not everyone is going to resonate with the same icon. So you might want to actually do some user experience testing with these as well. And then we get into texture and optics. So texture, um, especially if you're doing geospatial, it's very common to use, you know, something that's more like a wavy line to indicate if something is uh, a mountain range, you can see some of those topographical kinds of, of maps. Uh, you can also show some of the shading. You might also see something that is a little bit coarser looking if it's fuzzy, not very well understood. Um, so kind of trying to take the feelings that you want to impart to your end users and show that in a visual way. And last is something that is really opening up now is optics. So if you missed my video on what is the metaverse and all of that, AR and VR are certainly becoming uh, popular ways of interacting with data visualization. Um, something else that you might wanna think about is WebGL is a programming language where you can actually take the 2D um, you know, visualization of your graph and I'll put up an example here on the screen that I actually did in my day job where you can actually move the graph in all of its axes. This is actually really fun if you have like touch screen, that sort of thing. And um, also giving yourself that, that ability to zoom in. If you're zooming into the graph, does it just make the uh, nodes bigger or does it actually go deeper into the graph? It actually like is serves almost as a filter. All right, so those are the main considerations and data types that you might wanna think about while you're doing your data visualization. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.